now. So cheer, we are now live. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Councilman Isaiah Thomas, and I am the chair of the Streets and Services Committee. I want to thank everybody for viewing this morning and watching their government in action. I want to thank uh, all of my colleagues who came to join us in the hearing this morning and everybody that came to testify. Um, with that being said, we'll, be starting with, we'll get started with the hearing today. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquire, Legal Intelligence, or prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Mr. Maynard, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you're present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Also, I, I, please, uh, as a reminder, if you're not a member of council, uh, please mute your microphone. Mr. Maynard. Uh, Chairman Thomas. Present. Vice, Cha uh, Vice Chairman Squilla. Vice Chairman Squilla. Council Member Bass. Member, Council Member O. Present. Good morning. Good to see you, Chairman. Thanks for the committee hearing. Thank you, Council Member O. Council Member Brooks. Council Member Brooks. Council Member Johnson. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Council Member and Gilmore Richardson. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum uh, with five member, five of the seven members currently present. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. A quorum of the committee is present and the hearing is now called to order. This is a public hearing of the committee on streets and services regarding bills number 200351 and 200352. Mr. Maynard, will you please read the title of the bills? Mr. Maynard, you're on mute. Thank you, Council Member. Bill number 200351, an ordinance authorizing the operation of sidewalk cafes during the COVID-19 emergency until December 31st, 2020, in areas of the city where such activity currently must be otherwise authorized by special ordinance, and allowing expanded activity by current licensed sidewalk cafe operations, all under certain terms and conditions. And bill number 200352, <clears throat> an ordinance amending chapter 11, one, uh, section 100 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled General Provisions, to authorize the streets department to make, permit closure of the public right of way, including on-street parking spaces for public health, welfare, and safety purposes, during the COVID-19 public health emergency until December 31st, 2020, including the expansion of business uses that cannot operate in indoor environment or have limited indoor capacity and or service due to the COVID-19 emergency, all under certain terms and conditions. Those are the bills before us, sir. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Before we begin to hear testimony from witnesses, we have for today. Everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that the public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, uh, because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for questions or comments they have for the witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available on Microsoft Teams 
to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for members' purposes. Mr. Maynard, will you please call the first panel of witnesses to testify this morning? Just one moment, council member. Take your time, Mr. Maynard. Thank you, sir. Chairperson Thomas and members of the Streets and Services Committee. My name is Mike Carroll and I am the Deputy Managing Director of the Office of Transportation, Infrastructure and Sustainability, we call OTIS. I'm here to testify on bills number 200351 and 200352. On behalf of the Kenny Administration, I want to thank the bill sponsors, Council Members Dom and Heenan, for sponsoring the legislation and for working with us on proposed amendments to bill number 200351. These bills will codify into legislation emergency measures that provide businesses that are devoted to dining and leisure an opportunity to offer dining beyond limits of center city. The bills allow the city to put forth appropriate regulations that ensure the enjoyment and safety of patrons, businesses, and residents alike. We must recognize that the enterprise and innovation of these businesses has promoted the resurgence of many diverse neighborhoods throughout the city over many years. It is our job as a city to make sure they continue to be successful and these bills will help do just that. To that end, we have identified four paths to create the space for safe, socially distanced outdoor dining, including expanded opportunities for sidewalk cafes, streeteries to allow dining along the curbside on the street, a pilot program to allow for full street closures, and finally, opportunities for dining on parking areas and private lots. Various city departments collaborated on providing plain language guidance and a streamlined electronically accessible application process to support outdoor dining during phase yellow of the COVID emergency. The guidance is available right now at www.philo.gov slash safer at home. I strongly encourage business owners and other interested parties to review that material. We will be updating our guidance continuously over the summer as we learn more from this experience during the course of combating the COVID-19 pandemic. I also note that we have agreed to waive the license fees so that applications for sidewalk cafes will be reviewed within three business days. More complex proposals, like those that seek to build platforms and parking lanes, will require a longer review process, but we will do our best to expect, expedite them as quickly as possible. Work it has taken to get to this moment makes me tremendously proud, and I would like to share those sentiments with you. The cross-collaboration involved many city departments. Many of our staff devoted long hours of their personal time to this effort while continuously battling the uh, causes of the, the, the consequences of the pandemic and taking care of the regular business. Only a few weeks ago, on May 27th, Governor Wolf announced that Philadelphia would be eligible to transition to phase yellow of the pandemic. And shortly later, he announced that outdoor dining would be allowed. Previous to that moment, outdoor dining was only anticipated as part of phase green and therefore possibly months further away. This required immediate action on the part of a disparate collection of city departments, which had only weeks before endured a significant staff reduction on their own. We're grateful for the opportunity to support the restart of this sector of the economy, and we are sober about the challenges ahead. We do look forward, though, to the partnership it will take to be successful as we are all in this together. Lastly, we need to recognize that we are at a crossroads 
As we move forward, we need to continue to take COVID-19 very seriously. Many individuals and some communities across the nation appear to have abandoned caution in their approach to reopening. Our very lives depend on not doing so here in Philadelphia. It is the responsibility of every Philadelphian to be their neighbor's keeper in making this a success. If you see something that appears wrong, say something. Be polite, but let people know that it is important to be safe, to maintain social distancing, and to keep your face covered whenever you can. If we do not all share an accountability, these new privileges will all be taken away from us. And I do not mean by any action of government when I say that. This would simply be the fate of underestimating the persistent hazard of a second deadly wave of COVID-19. The administration supports the passage of these bills, and I thank you for this time. This concludes my testimony, and I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Before I open the floor up to any questions, I want to just take a minute to recognize um, the Vice Chair of the Student Service Committee has joined us, Councilman Mark Swallow, um, as well as our Council President, Council President Dow Clark. So thank you for joining us, and uh, we appreciate you guys. It, does anyone have any questions for this witness? I actually do. Council President, good morning, and please. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't normally make an appearance at uh, committee hearings, uh, but for this one in particular, I think I need it this way in for a second. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Carroll, for your testimony. Um, I, I do have some concerns. Uh, I've spoken to the uh, one of the bill sponsors. Um, Saturday, drove down Main Street and went to a couple of other locations. And what I saw was uh, at the level of concern that I actually talked to our healthcare professionals. Uh, there was no social distancing. The tables were literally six inches apart. They had these cafe tables out on the sidewalk where people were drinking, right, or whatever, and they were face to face. It was packed. It was clearly no enforcement. Nobody had masks on. Uh, you literally could not walk down the street because of what was taking place on those sidewalks. Um, my concern, having been a person uh, who worked on sidewalk legislation, uh, because I do support CAPE and sidewalk legislation, I crafted the legislation that line, outlined the guidelines established so you would be able to have a passageway, all of that, and it started around Rittenhouse Square. So I'm very familiar with the issue. Um, one, um, as a result of the encroachment, because that's what this is, and I understand it's short term, and I understand it's an emergency, and I do. Uh, more than anybody else probably on this call or on this this teams understand the need to get revenue because we're probably going to get some you know news probably in the next couple of days about some declining revenues mm -hmm. but the simple reality is is that there was a process established where uh, community residents and all the other uh, entities interested parties including the district council person was deeply engaged in that process to make sure that it was a smooth transition to this operation I am very concerned that I don't see that here. Um, and while I understand the need and all the work that you all have done, uh, both on and off the clock, the reality is is that at the end of the day, if it's a problem on that sidewalk and it's a problem in that neighborhood, guess where the buck stops? It's going to stop the district council person like everything else does. Right? That's a challenge for me. So I'm not comfortable at this, and I don't know what your amendments are or what they say, um, and the types of operations, it doesn't appear to be any review um, of operations that could have been nuisance operations. Um, this can present a real challenge. The sidewalk ordinance that was crafted um, virtually in different business districts was done thoughtfully in a timely way, uh, adopting guidelines separate and aside from what we're dealing with now with this healthcare crisis. So I'm a little concerned that in the rush to and again, I want to emphasize, I do support this sidewalk cafe because we need some sort of revenue. But the rush to get people back in business, there's not, not been nearly enough uh, collaboration because, frankly speaking, I haven't been a part of that collaboration as the district council person that represents, you know, a significant part of the city that will have this activity. Um, I just want to go on the record. Health care and sign off really concerns me because this could potentially be problems for the residents 
uh, in that block, uh, as you know, um, there are uh, areas where you have commercial quarters where you have residents living on the same block. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that there could potentially be a situation where the sidewalk cafes can literally go and utilize the, the adjacent property owner sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I, I understand what everybody's trying to do, but I, I'm really concerned about the pace of this and, and whether or not there's been some thoughtful consideration um, beyond just the need to get people up and running. Uh, yeah, I, I hear everything you're saying, Council President, and uh, I think what we're looking at is that trade-off. Uh, you know, as this came at us, it came at us a little faster than we thought it would come. We did the best we could to maintain that dialogue with Council. I myself had some, some conversations with your staff. Uh, we could do more, but the trade-off in doing more of that is that we would take longer to get to the finish line, we feel like. Uh, especially with everything going on with us and everything going on with council, frankly, uh, trying to wrap up the budget. And, um, you know, it wasn't very clear at the beginning that there would be enough time in in this session to get this done legislatively. So, uh, you know, being here in front of you, being able to talk about it, I think that's certainly a milestone. But I, I want to be very clear that this is not the finish line. This is the start. Um, you know, to break things down a little bit, folks who had... Uh, the existing licenses, you know, the decision was made pretty quickly to give them the opportunity to go back out and, and start earning revenue again. And um, I think that sort of sets the whole stack of dominoes in motion in some respects because uh, the fact is that, you know, people who don't have that ability see that and then the question is, what are they going to do? And a lot of what you see out on the street really isn't sanctioned by law. It's people who are taking it on their own initiative to go ahead and set up something in the right of way and to start doing business, although legally they probably don't have the right to in many cases. So what we were faced with is to some extent the dilemma of trying to chase that from an enforcement perspective or getting in front of it and trying to provide some guidance that's going to try and channel people's behavior towards the best outcome we could hope for. And that's kind of the approach we took. By putting the guidance out there publicly, we expect everybody to look at that and to get registered so that then we do have a, a kind of a carrot and a stick. Uh, you know, we're going to be stepping up the enforcement as we go along a little bit. And the enforcers actually need to know what rules uh, they're asking people to abide by. Because you can imagine people who typically are on the street from either a sanitation perspective, a sweeps perspective, or an L&I perspective, you know, they weren't trained to enforce some of the health guidance that's been developed in the last couple couple of weeks, couple of months. And so we need to get them up to speed and get that collaboration within the administration going so that they can call on those resources, they have some simple information to work with, and they know where to point people in terms of how to do things right. Um, but I certainly would not want to uh, say that this isn't uh, something that's gonna be messy now and then, and we do need to fine tune a lot of it if we're gonna get done. And so we're very interested in working with council to figure out how to do that. So well, all the respect, uh, the balance that you reference um, when you're talking about the livelihood, literally the life of individuals, because more so than community sign off and council sign off, this whole issue around health guidance, I'm very concerned about the fact that although you reference employees, and I don't know where they're coming from to step up enforcement, because there's a likelihood that we may end up cutting back on employees based on the budget. If you don't pay attention to the health care issues as it relates to folks sitting next to each other, up in each other's face, drinking and talking, right, you're going to quickly be back in the red. And I didn't, it didn't, in your presentation, and I don't get a sense that, and I shouldn't just be talking to you directly because I know you're not the bill sponsor, but I'm just very concerned that, you know, the balance should be weighted towards health care issues. Yeah. And I don't know where these people are going to be to enforce it because there's no enforcement now, and we're not looking likely to add any additional people to the city's workforce given our budget, um, which I said we're going to get some very difficult news in a couple of days. So to rush out here and to do this, it kind of reminds me of a certain person down in, and I'm not comparing you all to the guy at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, but this whole rush to trying to get the economy up and running, you know, 
we got to make sure that we have guidelines. We got to make sure that there's enforcement. We have to make sure that these restaurateurs understand that you cannot set up chairs and tables literally next to each other. I mean, it was six, six inches at best. And people are just packed because people have been pent up. People want to get out there. I understand that, right? But the, the, the potential outcome of us not paying attention to these guidelines, and as you all know, the coronavirus is here. You know, just because it's warm and it's a holiday, you know, it didn't just decide to take off so we can enjoy ourselves. So I really need to hear a little more about that. And I need you to take it, you know, well, I'm not going to say that. I need you to give me a sense that this is going to be dealt with in a meaningful way. The restaurants understand that if you don't adhere to the guidelines, you literally will be eliminated from this program. Yeah, so certainly. Out of neighborhoods, and we saw enforcement in neighborhoods. It's not like enforcement is in Center City, unfortunately, in the recent protests. I mean, there's can't even enforce, in some instances, the criminal activity. So to think that somehow we're going to be able to enforce sidewalk cafes, I just don't see it. Yeah, so, absolutely. And and people need to know, you know, we are going to take your licenses away, not just the permit to be out on the street with a sidewalk cafe. All of your licenses are at stake if you violate the rules. And so, yeah, there will be a challenge getting enough boots on the ground. So the the path we take there is, you know, the severity of the consequences is extreme. And that's the best we can do with that. But I feel like if we put that out there, you will lose all of your licenses if you uh, persist in the wrong behavior. Everyone should get some warnings. But, you know, beyond two warnings, you're, you're going to be in trouble. You've, you clearly have demonstrated you cannot protect the public safety. And hopefully that message becomes very strong for everybody. We will do our best. I would like to see the guidelines in writing that you've established for both uh, the operation and the enforcement and who will do enforcement. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we are working on that now. Hopefully, hopefully by the end of this week, middle of this week, that should be all spelled out. Right. I've been a veteran of these hearings for a long, long time, and I've heard promises and, and commitments, and some of them I'm still waiting for from years past, not to suggest that you did that, but been there, heard that. Uh, so. I just, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council President. Um, the chair is going to recognize Council Member Dom first so he can uh, talk about and elaborate on the bill. And then after Council Member Dom, we're going to recognize Vice Chair Squill for a question, then Council Member O, then Council Member Bass. Uh, Council Member Dom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. I just want everyone to be aware that uh, we are submitting amendments that allow for input relating to the health and safety of the community by both district council members and community members during the review process. So hopefully those amendments will be received very soon. And we're trying to address all the concerns. I know the council president I spoke yesterday about those issues and we'd like to address those issues. So we want to figure out a way to make sure that district council people uh, have a way in and that the health issues that the council president discussed that he saw in one of the areas of the city does not occur across the city with special social distancing. And if anyone violates it, their license has to be pulled. So uh, we'll distribute those amendments and hopefully um, those will be uh, acceptable. I wanted to just speak about these two bills today for a moment. The two bills we're discussing today are, are really vital to creating a healthy and safe, what we call smart restart. I want to thank my colleague, council member Bobby Heenan for co-introducing these bills. Also want to recognize everyone on the hospitality working group, which included Council members Clark, Keona Sanchez, Parker, Squirrel, Johnson, Eden Green, and Gilmore Richardson, along with the Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association, especially Melissa Bova, our area restaurants, the Hotel Association, Ed Gross, and other associations and labor members. We created this working group to seek input and guidance from industry leaders regarding how council could help them weather this crisis. We heard a few issues raised immediately. One was the issue of food delivery service contractors, which I want to thank council member parker for taking on last week another was the need for a plan to help restaurants fill their seats within the rules and regulations given to us from our public health experts so today's bills are the result of our findings and discussions generated through the hospitality working group the first bill which we've heard will allow restaurants regardless of where they're located that's bill number 200351 to offer safe outdoor seating and cafe space on sidewalks in accordance with the city's specified rules and regulations Second bill, 200352, 
will allow the streets department to close all or portions of certain streets and courtway spaces, including on-street parking spaces, to support the expanded outdoor seating opportunity. Being able to use right-of-way space in the streets give restaurants with smaller indoor settings additional options to accommodate proper distancing for diners. We want to be sure that when the city moves to the yellow phase, we're prepared to allow for outdoor seating citywide. And the legislature reassures businesses that the city's efforts to help them reopen are clearly defined and written into our code during COVID-19. We appreciate the mayor's administration for providing input on these bills and want the legislation to complement their current efforts. City government right now in this climate has to be flexible and immediate in its ability to respond to the constantly changing dynamics associated with COVID-19 pandemic. And I, along with my colleagues, look forward to the passage of these bills with the amendments so that we can assist the hospitality industry in a safe way all around the city during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dom. Uh, just for the record, I would also like to note that Council Member Kendra Brooks has joined us. Uh, good morning, Council Member. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilman Swill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak and ask a question. Uh, President Clark had asked a question about uh, the Council Member's input, but uh, to Mike Cow, um, if there are things that we see as this progresses, since it's, I know it sunsets at the end of the year, is there a way, since it's a regulation, to adopt the regulation to make changes during this process, even though somebody already has a permit, and if we could tweak things along the way, if we see it causes problems in certain areas? Yeah, we, we can make some adjustments through regulation for sure. Uh, there are going to be some limits. You know, the broad scope of this is going to be set by the legislation. But <clears throat> fortunately, the legislation allows for regulation. And so that kind of gives us the one-two punch to refine this over the summer. Right, because I think, you know, obviously in, everything looks good on paper sometimes till we put it into practice. And then we yeah. start, this doesn't really work right. So. I think if we have that ability to say, all right, this is what we said initially, but this has now changed and we have to amend this in a way to let the, the folks know. And I think the other thing is to be able to have a hand if there is some pushback from the community or an operator who's not acting properly or maybe he goes after the allowed hours. Yeah. Um, the recourse has to be there where we could then act on it and not have to go through a six month process to to, to make a decision. Uh, I might I might ask uh, uh, maybe Sarah Damo from LNI to weigh in a little bit about the uh, the different steps that would be taken in case of uh, violations and in particular when we're dealing with nuisance businesses. Uh, Sarah, would you be kind enough to come off mute and give a little bit of feedback on that? Sure. Um, we've had a couple of meetings about this topic within the past few days. Um, and we are prepared to draft and hopefully finalize an MOU between multiple departments by the end of the week. Um, this would really be a, a multifaceted approach to um, the enforcement of these different um, street areas and sidewalk cafes. It would include um, streets sweeps officers. Um, Health Department, 911, Police Department, um, as well as uh, the Parking Authority. And um, what we're trying to draft in this MOU is um, a process where there's um, essentially three warnings and then your license gets pulled. Um, both Health and LNI have the authority to revoke licenses. So depending on what the violations are, um, we need a lot of communication between all of these departments that would be enforcing. So that's really what our goal is with this MOU to document, um, essentially create a, a flow chart. If the um, violation is behavioral, it would start with the police department. If it's um, social distancing, it would start with health. If it's a physical issue uh, related to your streetery or sidewalk cafe, it starts with streets department and then it will end up either with LNI or health to pull the license when appropriate. Thank you. I, I also want to add, um, you know, we will do our best to kind of have that conversation. 
up front with the businesses. I mean, we try to pull as much as possible the context for this into the guidance document. But what we're what we're hearing from the businesses is that they are very desperate, and you know they need to get out there because this is their survival at stake. And so, if there's issues, the message back to the businesses is something along the lines of, "You can't afford to screw this up. You know, you're you're not you're not going to be in business if you keep coming back needing second chances. So do it right the first time." And you know that that approach, I think, hopefully, uh, gets us that that responsiveness and accountability that I spoke about in my testimony because that's what it's going to take for this to work. People just have to be accountable. Well, I think you're going to see that from most of them. There's always outliers, outliers there that always want to push the envelope for whatever reason. Certainly. And, yeah. and they're the ones that make it bad for everybody else. So as long as we have the flexibility to deal with them and if they're hours, like they go over hours or whatever it may be, if we could do that and so therefore you don't end up throwing the baby out with the bathroom water and scrapping everything, as long as we have a way to stop that, that would help us to then be able to get rid of the bad actors and, and keep the people who are serious about doing the business you know, able to continue to do that. So that, that, that was just my concern. And, and obviously it's still a work in progress. So we'll continue to work in that manner uh, to make sure everybody abides by the rules. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, council member. Chair recognizes council member O. Thank you very much, chairman. Um, I don't so much have a question, but if you could respond, that would be great. I just want to say that, um, you know, I support this legislation. I think everybody does. It's intention, but as an at-large council member, I, I generally think in terms of the city, but not the districts. And I've heard from district council people that they are concerned. And I agree and appreciate the fact that they know their districts and the nooks and crannies far better than I do. They know the history of the businesses, as council president said, who are the good actors, not so good actors. Uh, I go through the whole city, but I am not in each of the districts as much as the district council people. So I'm glad to hear that there are um, discussions and amendments. Um, I'd like to uh, make sure that they're satisfactory to the council members, the district council members who are engaged. Uh, with that said, I will say that um, I completely agree with, uh, with you, Deputy Mayor, that businesses which provide jobs, health insurance, and much needed tax revenues to this city are in great jeopardy, and so are we. I think it's made worse by the fact that we don't have a regional, consist there's no consistent regional um, guideline or protocol. Um, what I see is that right now, uh, people that I know can go 15 minutes out from where I live into a different county or 35 minutes into another county and join the gym. They can, they, can do, they can go to a restaurant, uh, they socialize, they go to the shore, and then they come back to Philadelphia. And so I'm not sure, kind of like if people are going out and doing all these things and coming back into the city where they mix and mingle with everyone else, and, and you know, there, there has been a lot of people gathering as a result of the issues of the murder of George Floyd. Important issues, of course, but that further has kind of said to people, what is with the social distancing? I think the social distancing is losing a lot of credibility, even though it's, I'm not saying it's not important, it is important, but what happens is we did the social distancing, I understood when I say we government, because of lack of capacity in the healthcare system. There's no lack of capacity right now of course, they have to be concerned about, you know, when people get together, there will be a lack of capacity. But so far, I mean, the Leah Cora Center isn't used. We've stopped talking about the Convention Center, Hahnemann University. Uh, you know, all that type of thing is challenging. Uh, and so I do think that there, there are really um, a lot of doubts. I would say that faith in government is at an all-time low for a lot of reasons. Um, and I, I hope that um, this bill can be amended in an in intelligent way for you know, the particulars of each section of the city, but also um, recognizing that uh, people can do and are doing a lot of things that they didn't used to do outside of, outside of our city and they are changing their habits 
and they are and they are increasing, you know, their their social contact, and they're coming to a city that is that 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 um, once they've changed those behaviors, uh, they, they they it takes them a long time, if at all, to to return to what they're doing in our city. So I know it's a lot on your plate. Um, and uh, I appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. Chair recognizes Council Member Betts. Good morning. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Good morning. How are you today, Councilman? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. I have some concerns about this bill. I've talked to the bill sponsor. Um, last night and again this morning and we talked with staff and I share a lot of the council president's concerns uh, one about um, safety and social distancing and the um, you know it, it appears right now that there is mi mixed messaging that we're telling people to uh, you know do all the things that we were saying just a month ago two months ago um, but it doesn't feel as if people are really taking it uh, seriously. Um, in a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of areas, people want to get out. The weather's nice. I understand all of that. Um, but I have a lot of concerns about the social distancing aspect of, uh, you know, what, what is being proposed. Um, the second, and I think probably larger concern uh, at this moment, is once we get past COVID and once we get past um, you know, uh, the, the health and safety concerns that we have right now is the ongoing problem, which has been um, nuisance businesses operating in the districts. And um, as you are aware, I've been working uh, around uh, how do we uh, affect nuisance businesses? How do we really have a quality of business throughout our entire city so that I can eat you know, uh, and have a, a, a similar experience in Chestnut Hill or Rittenhouse Square that I'm going to have on North 22nd Street or in Germantown um, or in Logan or any other part yeah. of, of the city of Philadelphia. And so right now, that's not what we have. In my district, uh, I represent Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, Germantown, Nice Town, Tioga, part of Ollie, part of Logan, uh, part of Feltonville, and part of North Philadelphia, and part of West Oak. commercial corridors, we don't have the quality of restaurants um, that I would like to see. And what we do have, you know, there, there's a few here and there, but overall, we don't have the same sort of sit down dining experience that you have uh, in other communities. And so uh, what we do have, and I've said this before, is we have a lot of um, nuisance establishments, um, which include stop and go establishments, which uh, have a liquor license. And so, uh, so they say they sell uh, food. Normally, that food is like hot dogs, or it's um, you know uh, uh, oodles and noodles, or ramen noodles, or whatever you want to call them. And so, they've been able to operate during COVID, um, you know, as as if they have a real restaurant and they're serving real food. When we all know, those of us who know, know that what they did is essentially they moved their operation to the sidewalk for pickup, and people are picking up shots of liquor and they're consuming them out on the sidewalk and so you know this is something that i've been uh, talking about for years uh, i know that you're familiar with it and we work with commissioner perry and commissioner farley who have been great and who certainly recognize the concern and the issue but we really haven't moved the needle and my concern is that having you know, just sort of granting uh, this this opportunity without having input from the district council person is a problem. So, uh, as I said, I've spoken with the bill sponsor. Um, I know that they are going to have some uh, amendments that are going to be offered that our office is going to uh, review this morning. Um, I'm not going to be able to support this bill, uh, either of these bills, um, without district council support. Uh, being added in, uh, and that it's absolutely a necessity. Um, I heard it being said a couple of times that there was going to be a um, district council weigh-in and community weigh-in. Does that mean I just give a letter of, uh, you know, this is what I think, and then I've weighed in? Um, you know, like, is, is that what that means, or does it mean more significantly that I have the opportunity to, to say uh, yay or nay? Because at the end of the day, the district council person is the person who is called councilwoman bass what are you going to do about this what are you going to do about that and if i don't have a ready answer that 
okay, we're going to enforce and we're going to, you know, shut down a nuisance stop and go, which is right now serving uh, uh, shots of liquor to people who are inebriated out on the sidewalk right now. Um, you know, what, what kind of response am I going to be able to give people? Um, I, I agree with my colleague, Councilman O, that there is an all-time low in terms of uh, respect and, and uh, belief in government. And I think that what we need to do is make sure that government works for everyone. And um, if we're going to put out a proposal like this, we really have to make sure that uh, this is going to work for everyone, not just Rittenhouse Square and Chestnut Hill, but it's got to work in North Philly. It's got to work in West Philly. It's got to work, you know, in, in, in the hood, so to speak, um, so that people are, uh, uh, their concerns are addressed. So I just wanted to put that out there. And I also really quickly wanted to mention that in 2016, I believe it was, we did a bill called the Nuisance Business Bill, um, which is with three warnings, your license could be pulled by L&I. Um, th th based on what I have seen so far, because it required really the community um, to uh, uh, enforce, uh, to, to provide a level of information to enforcement, because we didn't have enough inspectors to do enforcement um, and to uh, look out on look out for these uh, nuisance issues on their own. And so um, it's my understanding that even though this bill was passed in 2016, uh, which required the three warnings and then the license w could be pulled, um, you know, like I, I don't, to my knowledge, I don't know that, that this has happened, that this has occurred. So even though we're circulating an MOU saying the exact same thing right now, we have a bill on the books and uh, we haven't had the, level of uh, enforcement on that that we would like to see. So I don't know if you can address that later down the road in this hearing, but um, that's cert certainly something that I would like to uh, have addressed. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, yeah, if I could just re respond very quickly sure. uh, on a couple of things. Yeah, we definitely understand what you're talking about. That is something we've been considering from the very beginning, um, you know, also in, in talking these issues out with the bill sponsors. I think the thing that we are relying on council for is to kind of set that balance between the amount of, of way and an input that needs to take place at the district level and the timeliness. And, you know, and what, what you're looking at and, uh, you know, what we've made public in terms of our guidance, at least for this interim period, we, uh, you know, shifted towards the timeliness, trying to get this done sooner, understanding the level of desperation. But now uh, council yeah. has an opportunity to, to reset that balance so that that way it is more uh, meaningful. And, you know, I, I do understand uh, from some of the back and forth of the law department wants to try and set some parameters, you know, to make sure that, uh, you know, there's sort of a, a relationship between the legislation that's on the book and the way that the uh, administration enforces it and, and makes use of that input. So how fine-tuned we can be, I think, is the main issue that that's going to create. But I think we do have an opportunity as we're looking to make these amendments to, to try and get that the, these individual trade-offs right. So we're, we're eager to see how we can work this stuff out. I, I think... I think that, um, you know, the administration uh, and I think the bill sponsors, um, you know, everybody has the best of intentions. But, um, you know, again, as a district council person, I, you know, I, I know who the good players are and I know who the not so good players are. Um, you know, there's no reason I don't want a business to be able to have sidewalk sales and increase their business and stay afloat. You know, where we have good businesses that, you know, in commercial corridors that, that desperately need them. There's no reason that we want to stand in the way. But I also think that if, um, you know, if we do sidewalk sales, and I know that this, again, goes until December, uh, and then the, the these particular licenses would fade away. Is that correct? They would sunset in uh, December? I'm sorry. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so... If, you know, it, it, it hasn't um, been lost on me that these licenses could go until December. And in some areas where you have nuisance businesses, um, they are going to be outside in December. You know, I know that people think, oh, well, it's just a spring, a summer thing. No, nope. you know, you're going to, because what is going to happen is you're going to have, you know, people who are, who, who have other intentions. I'll just put it that way who are going to be in those seats on those sidewalks. 
And so, again, this becomes problematic, um, you know, for, for those of us who are in the district and who know our districts well. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we really do have to have uh, an opportunity to more than just weigh in and say what we think, but to say if a project can go forward. So, again, I, I would love to be able to support this uh, opportunity for, um, uh, you know, restaurants and, and businesses to be able to get back on their feet. But there has to be some recognition that uh, what happens in a lot of our neighborhoods is different than what happens in Center City and some of our more affluent neighborhoods. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bass. Chair recognizes Councilmember Gilmore Richardson. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to put on the record and, and thank my colleague, Councilmember Dom, uh, for convening the Hospitality Working Group and for their work on these bills. And I also appreciate uh, the concerns raised uh, by the district council members, including our council president, around the nuanced challenges and uh, circumstances and issues uh, relative to what goes on uh, within our neighborhoods. Uh, I wanted to uh, further clarify and talk about uh, when this bill would sunset. You would sunset this bill in December, uh, but how do you plan to work with uh, those businesses moving forward who do not have permanent, um, you know, sidewalk cafes to ensure that they can start the process? Because my office has worked with uh, one constituent, uh, one business uh, that needed assistance with um, getting this approval, and they really had a hard time uh, interfacing uh, with the city and contacted our office and we help them and eventually you know more than a year later they were able to um, you know have sidewalk uh, seating outside of their business but how does the city and, and in particular these departments Mr. Carroll plan on working with these businesses uh, so that they can work with uh, within the confines of the normal process which includes uh, district council member input uh, to ensure that uh, they can have this type of seating uh, either moving forward and or they go through uh, the regular process, which would have district council uh, person input. Yes, so you, you are correct. This is going to last through December and then, you know, hopefully, God willing, everything goes back more or less to normal. But we do understand that uh, what previously had been normal may not be good enough for certain people in certain circumstances. So, um, you know, just uh, to set the theme, I'm hopeful that we learn a lot from interacting with a different variety of businesses than we typically do around these issues that we can carry forward on a permanent basis. But I can't say quite at this time what that's going to look like uh, beyond sort of like a continuous improvement, um, you know, approach that we take to this. Um, I should be real clear, you know, the reason why we provided four different options is because any one option isn't going to work in every situation. So you will find in, in you know, a variety of uh, lo locations that there just isn't enough sidewalk. And, um, you know, especially when we're talking about social distancing, that is not going to be a, a workable approach for certain businesses. So that is why we made the parking lane available for, you know, what we call streeteries or, or curbside uh, dining. And, you know, one of the things we may learn is that that needs to be a permanent opportunity for people because, you know, even if COVID-19 wasn't in front of us, uh, when you talk about ADA, uh, you know, when you talk about, you know, folks in wheelchairs or blind folks getting by cafes, which has been shown to be an issue, uh, when you talk about the complete streets policies the city has with respect to just, you know, anybody having uh, an adequate amount of space without pinch points or needing to kind of duck and dodge people in chairs, the sidewalk isn't always the best place to do this. So we need to keep a real perspective on broadening out the opportunities for people. So I suspect that that's going to be an important uh, set of tools for us to work with to make these uh, these options open for people. Sure, and I say that knowing that we don't have an exact timetable on when a vaccine will be available. So, you know, we have to plan for that from a public health perspective uh, and think about that as we move forward with uh, the reopening phases in the city. But I do um, just wanted to put on the record uh, that I had concerns around the, the lengthiness of the process for a business that we have worked with uh, and how we are ensuring that uh, the district council members can have input. So I, I would appreciate if you could give uh, 
you know, me some specifics and I'll work with the other departments to make sure we take a good look and kind of do some analysis to figure out what happened in that situation so that we can, you know, make any fixes we need to and, and make sure next time around it's much smoother. Sure, I appreciate that. I'll have my office follow up with your team uh, offline with the information. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you, Council Member. Uh, Chair re again recognizes Council Member Swilla. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, Mike, too, I, now to apply for these online, um, from what I understand, the uh, tax clearance site is down, so people aren't able to apply. Um, is that something that has to be corrected, um, or is it? Can they do that while the tax clearance site is still down? Well, uh, I I feel like they should be able to do it independent of the tax clearance site. The applications that we have set up uh, it, are working through license and inspections uh, Eclipse platform. So there is uh, you know an expectation that folks are either in tax compliance or they're actively in a program. Uh, I do not think that the check though requires any access to the uh, to the tax site. And so, you know, we're taking it on faith that people in um, affirming their status are telling us the truth. And so we can follow up after the fact if we find out that they don't have the tax clearance or they don't have a food license or they don't have a business license. You know, these are things that we're willing at, at least to get out of the gate to address as follow-up. May I chime in, please? Go ahead, sir. Um, so Eclipse, although it is a separate site from the revenue tax clearance site, they are tied together. So prior to license issuance, um, a tax check is done. Um, my understanding is that since most restaurants recently would have had to renew their license just because of the time of year that it is. Most restaurants should be tax compliant right now and it shouldn't be an issue. Um, I did hear that on Friday there was a firewall issue with um, the revenue tax clearance website. The word firewall is very beyond my understanding of things and I, I'm an engineer, I don't know, <laughs> you know, tech things. Um, but I can assure you that several um, permits, licenses, things of that sort were all issued over the weekend. So I think that issue is cleared up. Um, however, it's entirely outside of Eclipse. All uh, right, because I know with Eclipse, um, when they do it, it does connect through um, uh, the revenue for tax clearance because it won't issue the permit if you have back taxes. Um, mm -hmm. And if that continues to be down, there's a problem with the firewall which means they, they believe there might be some access into that site. Yeah. Um, that may cause a problem for anybody being able to get issue a permit uh, automatically. We'll, be, we'll, co we'll continue to troubleshoot that. It does sound like it's uh, a technical issue. At least we got we got some permits through. So we'll keep working on that. We'll give you an update if there's any. I just didn't know if there was a way to override it, the way to be able to then issue these permits, and then as that gets fixed, and then maybe consolidate it at, at another time. I didn't. Didn't know if you had that. We would be able to continue our review, and that would be the only outstanding item. So, when the time came that the firewall issue was corrected, the license would automatically issue at that point. But my concern was, would you even be able to apply? Because you, you can't even apply if you have. Alan. Yeah. Yeah, um, oh. Sarah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought someone else was trying to speak. Um, that I'm not sure of. I was under the impression that you could apply even if the tax clearance website was down, but I will uh, check on that. Yeah, we'll check and get back to you. Thanks for the clarifications too, Sarah. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, just for a point of clarity, Sarah, can you just say your first and last name for the record in your position? I don't sure. think you ever that. I apologize. Uh, sure. My name is Sarah Adamo. I'm the Legislative Affairs Manager and Zoning Administrator for the Department of Licenses and Inspections. Thank you. And I apologize. I should have asked you that earlier. Mr. Carroll uh, called you to testify. Just one more question for the administration before uh, we move on to the next witness. Um, just, and this is uh, for myself and clarity. Uh, just looking at the idea of um, this expansion, how would this impact a uh, liquor license and what uh, for businesses who are allowed to sell liquor, um, what privileges or expansions will they now be permitted to have 
um, if this legislation were to pass. Uh, so I'm sorry, Mr. Carroll, before you go, um, um, we will be calling the next witness to testify after Mr. Carroll answers this question so you can be ready. Go ahead, Mr. Carroll, apologize. No problem. So yes, yeah, so the city does not enforce uh, the liquor license beyond what the state establishes uh, from the liquor control board. So we don't have the ability to kind of fine tune uh, people's liquor licenses to different conditions in the city. Either they can serve alcohol or they can't, and that's something we we uh, you know struggled with a little bit, but you know ultimately we went forward based on that fact. Uh, so if people are available to uh, conduct outdoor dining and they have a liquor license the state provided uh, a couple weeks ago then the ability to serve alcohol on the sidewalk at sidewalk cafes they did not allow for uh, liquor explicitly to be served um, within the what we call the cartway between the curbs but we're making provisions so that at the discretion of the commissioner we will accept their uh, ability to serve alcohol in those contexts as well. That's one area where, um, you know, because it is not explicitly called out in state law, if we do have issues, we would be able to react uh, as the city, independent of the state. Thank you. Um, Council Member Bass has a question. Before Council Member Bass goes, uh, Mr. Maynard, can you please read, uh, can you please tell us who the next person to testify will be so they can prepare? Testify is uh, Richard Montanez, the Deputy Commissioner for Transportation. Okay, we'll be calling him next. Um, but before we do that, Chair recognizes. So, so, Good. I'm sorry. I was I was actually giving testimony for all the administration folks. I mean, if there's specific questions to the Streets Department, uh, the testimony I gave was for both bills, and there might have been a little. <laughs> I know that there's no fee for these licenses. Is that yeah. correct? And actually, the term license is, is uh, too expansive because what we're doing is we are registering uh, businesses that are asking for sidewalk cafes outside of Center City, um, you know, so that we can keep track of who has them. But there is no license. What, what the uh, legislation essentially does is it, you know, uh, for a temporary period, suspends enforcement of the existing restriction on sidewalk cafes, those conditions, and also the conditions that people abide by the health restrictions and don't operate as a, as a nuisance. We are issuing permits uh, for all the activity between the curbs, whether that's a streetery or a street closure, and license and uh, inspection, and Sarah will correct me in a minute, uh, is uh, giving, uh, you know, temporary zoning uh, privileges for folks to operate uh, on private lots, parking lots, and so forth. Okay, so these are permits. Um, so what's the general cost of a permit? I know that because there, this, there is not going to be a cost associated with this yeah. for the businesses. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what normally does it cost. Yeah. And what so for these doing. types of things, it ranges from about, you know, $180 down to, uh, uh, legislated minimum of $20. Uh, you know, we've got a series of different types of closure permits uh, for things like this, which are, you know, the 30 or $50 range. And, uh, you know, that's sort of what we expect to start with is something, you know, between 20 and $50. Okay. So, um, do we have a sense of how many businesses we think would take advantage of this? Like how school, yeah, how I, I don't, I don't have that crystal ball. Um, you know, we think that there's a, a few hundred that we could expect, but it really depends on how it goes. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, and, and the last thing I want to ask is that early on someone, I can't remember if it was you or the other young lady who had spoken, who said that, you know, um, that licenses will be removed for bad behavior of businesses. And uh, in my experience, that's way easier said than done. And so I'm trying to get a sense of how many have we, how many businesses uh, have we pulled licenses from for bad behavior of one sort or another in the last year, could you say? Yeah. 
I, I could ask uh, Sarah to answer, but I, th I think we're going to need to get back to you with that type of uh, detail if you're, you'll are you allow us to do that. We'll try and turn that right around. I, I would like uh, to have that information before the vote today. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. Um, are there any other questions for this witness? Um, hearing none, Mr. Carroll, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Gaynard, please call the next um, witness to testify. The next witness to testify will be Melissa Bova from the Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association. After that will be Todd Carmichael from La Colum. Okay, thank you. Melissa, before you go, um, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge that Council Member Bobby Heenan has joined us. Um, Council Member Heenan, thank you for joining us. Would you i uh, like to give any remarks before our next witness testifies. Okay, that's not Melissa, feel free. Uh, thank you for joining us, please, Ms. Melissa, uh, feel free to communicate your testimony. Thank you, Council Member Thomas, uh, members of the committee for allowing me to offer a little bit of feedback today on the bills that are being considered. We do have some restaurateurs uh, that are going to testify today as well. But uh, as I did previously in another hearing, wanted to provide a broad overview and also reiterate PRLA's commitment uh, to the efforts that the city is going through today. Uh, my name is Melissa Bova. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs at the PRLA uh, and wanted to thank uh, Councilman Dom, Councilmember Heenan, uh, and all of the co-sponsors of these pieces of legislation for your support. Uh, the restaurant industry is decimated, would be the, the only way to put it, from the recent COVID crisis. We shut our doors. We did what we needed to do uh, to protect our employees, protect our guests. And this legislation, we think, is a really great step to try and help restaurants see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, to put it in perspective, uh, the governor did allow and is allowing outdoor dining in the yellow phase. Uh, we do not know when Philadelphia will hit green phase of reopening. To that end, when that does happen, restaurants will be opening at 50% capacity with the clarifying information that all tables need to be socially distanced. So restaurants, for the most part, will not even be able to hit 50%, even uh, by being as creative as they possibly can in terms of the guidelines from the governor's office. So this legislation really is uh, a creative, thoughtful way to allow restaurants, wherever they are in the city, responsible restaurants to expand their space, whether it's via sidewalk path, uh, sidewalk cafe expansion, eateries, or even going into some parking lots or shutting down streets to allow the outdoor dining experience uh, that people want to go out and enjoy. And I think that's a key part here. Uh, restaurants, more than anyone, take classes and are required to sanitize things. It's actually the basis of our entire existence to ensure a healthy environment for our guests. To that end, uh, I do know that there are some concerns from district council members and uh, Councilwoman Bast. I was happy to work with you uh, on that stop and go legislation in 2016. We continue to be committed uh, to stopping bad operators. And to that end, PRLA is committed to ensuring that we will not defend any restaurant that does not follow the social distancing guidelines, do not follow the guidelines that are iterated by the state and the city. We have a reputation here as well, uh, and we don't want the bad operators breaking the rules any more than you do. Uh, to that end, of course, as was mentioned by the city, uh, they can pull licenses, and we would not oppose that. If somebody is not following the rules, we have a privilege here that's to help the good operators get through on the other side of that. We recognize that, and we want to make sure that the good guys can continue to do the right thing, and the guys that aren't following the rules can't. Uh, also, there was some talk about liquor licenses. Uh, Councilwoman Bass will probably laugh a, a little bit about this, but I've never seen the LCE liquor code enforcement as active as they've been since this crisis began. And they can pull those liquor licenses. So it's not only operational licenses that can be pulled if people aren't following the rules. People can use, lose their liquor licenses as well, which is an expensive investment that businesses are making. So we just want to thank you for recognizing the need for the good guys to expand uh, and thrive and get through this. Every day we hear more restaurants are closing and this is just a reasonable way we believe to help people get through to the other side of this. And we stand as we have in the past and we continue, 
will to educate restaurants, making sure they're following the rules, and certainly not defending those that make a conscious decision not to. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. Chair recognizes Council Member Heenan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committees, uh, committee members. Uh, you know, this is a, a great opportunity to have this, these kinds of conversations and under, you know, uh, I guess uh, unattended consequences, all right, when it comes to the quality of life in our neighborhoods, the safety of our neighborhoods, ongoing issues, all right, that district council members deal with every single day. That's why uh, you know, I do want to thank the administration and, and, and the other stakeholders uh, who have been working collaboratively with uh, with council and especially uh, my my colleague and, and co-sponsor, uh, Alan Dom. All right. These are difficult times, as we well know. And, you know, we as a body, Mr. Chairman, all right, usually address the issues that are put in front of us. All right. City of Philadelphia and this body has never let us down and we are going to get through this. And the only way to get through it is to have these uh, difficult conversations and to make sure that, um, you know, we're thinking about all the consequences, especially when it comes to uh, public safety, right, and the health, as the council president had mentioned, and social distances. Uh, you know, what we have seen uh, over the weekend are, are people who are jumpy, right, people who really uh, want to reopen our city. And, you know, it is upon us to make sure that, you know, we, we allow that to happen, but we allow it to happen gradually, right, in, in the phase in that makes sense, that is healthy, and that, you know, members of this council and this committee feel comfortable with, you know, dealing with the issues that they have in the past and may foresee in the future, all right? But this also is a symbol, all right, to, to folks, all right, that uh, we are still operating as a city. We are still doing the city's work, and, you know, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, businesses, you know, want to choose the city of Philadelphia and remain here. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity uh, for these issues to be heard and all, all members of this committee and look forward to an ongoing uh, dialogue. And if we need to tweak things as we as we move forward, uh, then we need we need to have the ability to do that. And then I think Mike Carroll, deputy managing director, uh, has, uh, had spoken eloquently, eloquently about, you know, having those opportunities through regulations all right, to make sure all right, that we're doing it safely and we're doing it, uh, you know, with, with the, with, with the uh, public interest at first. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I thank you to be acknowledged and uh, look forward to uh, doing the city's work. Thank you, council member, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, are there any other questions or comments from any other members for this particular witness? There being none, uh, Mr. Maynard, will you please call the next witness? And um, to our previous witness, thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, the next witness is Todd Carmichael, the founder of Law Cologne. Uh, good morning, Chairman Thomas, and thank you, uh, Philadelphia City Council for taking the time to listen at this uh, very difficult, rare moment in the history of this city. Uh, I can attest to you, I'd, I'd rather be uh, making you all coffees right now rather than discussing the topics that we have. And I hope to do that in the very, very near future. Uh, I've offered a uh, written testimony, but I'll just give you a little recap here. Uh, I don't want to weigh down the process. Um, again, my name is Todd Carmichael. I'm the co-founder and CEO of La Cologne. Uh, I'm a transplant to the city. I'm the adopted son of Philadelphia. I came here with two boxes of clothes and some traveler's checks and a, and a very audacious idea that I wanted America, America to come to Philadelphia for a specialty coffee. That was 1993, and well, back then, uh, you know, the city was on its knees. It was a different sort of trauma the city was experiencing. It was nearly bankrupt, and it was dealing with a pandemic we called the crack cocaine crisis. Uh, since then, Philadelphia has really revived itself. It became one of the most livable cities in America. And a pride uh, in me to watch it as it grew from that, those humble beginnings and that difficult time to, to the recent time. You know, La Colombe has grown to a uh, valuation of right around $1 billion. We have almost 1,000 employees. Uh, we are in 75% of the stores across the United States. We 
roast coffee for 7,000 different hotels, restaurants, and cafes all across the country. Um, and so that goal of uh, you know, America coming to uh, Philly for their specialty coffee has come true. We've done really good together. And what really attracted me to the city was, well, it was its sense of innovation. This is the city that invented modern democracy. This was the city I loved for its ethnic mix. It, was, it had a soul. It had a way of dealing with its problems and, and grabbing life by the horns. And I loved its sidewalks. This was the walkable city. This was a city that you could go outside and you could use your legs and you can you can walk around and experience it from something other than an automobile. Um, this this was really one of the things that most attracted uh, me to the city. Now, when COVID hit, uh, I started hitting the dimmer switch around February. I started pulling out of things, and then we went completely dark by March 15th. All of my hospitality uh, restu- uh, restaurants and cafes, as you heard, uh, went dark uh, all across the country. It took out two thirds of our business. But I didn't look at it as a crisis as much as I looked at it as an opportunity. It was an opportunity for us to live our values. So today, I still have not released one of my employees. I want to maintain this thing through this through this this terrible time without anyone being thrown overboard. A lot of folks said we couldn't make it. There were no small business grants for me. There was nothing from the government. We were too big for the small and too small for the big. But we still hold on. Now, as we turn that demo switch back on, we try to bring these motors back to life. Our 34 cafes, as well as all the assistants of the hospitality clients, we're, we're starting to slowly ramp that up. We've laid out all of our cafes so we, they can be uh, safe inside with partitions, uh, creativity with PPE, et cetera, new, new policies to make sure that if someone comes into one of our cafes, they're safe. The problem becomes that same thing that attracted me to the city, the sidewalks. I'm not having this conversation in New York because they're wider. People can social distance on a sidewalk in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in Boston, in DC, in New York, but in my hometown, Philadelphia, they can't particularly on Frankfurt Avenue. The sidewalks are not wide enough for people to be safe. There are people that will gather out in front of the cafes across the city, and I feel that we may be putting them in the harm's way. They're safe indoors, but they're not safe outdoors. So what I'd like the, the city council to consider is that for the time during the COVID crisis that we relieve that pressure on a sidewalk, that we sacrifice a few parking spaces in front of businesses like mine to make sure that people can social distance. It doesn't, it stands to reason if they're safe indoors, they should be safe outdoors. Now I recognize the need for parking in this city and I know this is not an easy decision, but I feel that for a certain amount of time, we may have to sacrifice some parking spaces because I think that would be, well, it would relieve our sidewalks. It would relieve our businesses and it would protect our people. So I'd, I'd like you to, to read my, uh, my written testimony. I'm simply asking for the, for the city council to consider uh, a small act of, uh, of accommodating uh, people instead of the automobiles. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Does anyone on this committee have any questions for this witness? Seeing that there are none, um, again, thank you for your testimony. We really appreciate it. We will be sure to read the written testimony as well, too, as we deliberate on these bills. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Mr. Maynard, can you please call the next witness? The next witness is Nicole Marquis from Hip City Veg. And after that is Paul Levy from Center City District. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. I appreciate it. Um, to the next witness, again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for communicating your perspective. Please state, start by stating your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Nicole Marquis, founder and CEO of Hip City Veg, Bar Bon Bon, and Charlie Was a Sinner. You, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, members of the council, and thank you to the PRLA for all of your advocacy on our behalf. I am so glad to have a chance to work 
with you and to continue to move things forward together for our beautiful and struggling city. This weekend was such a boost for our morale and our revenue with outdoor seating. One of my team members, uh, Antonio, had moved here from Puerto Rico before the pandemic and was a bartender at Bar Bon Bon. It was really difficult for us to let him go when the shutdown hit because we knew what an essential part of the team he was and how much it meant to him to have this job. Seeing him return this weekend because of the increased volume that came with outdoor seating felt like a huge win. And the whole team cheered when he walked in. You know, the restaurant industry, including my nine restaurants, is still very much struggling. Takeout and curbside pickup have helped, as has selling cocktails to go. But like most of our brothers and sisters in the restaurant industry, we are still operating at 50% or less capacity, and we still face enormous challenges. The bill to increase outdoor seating capacity is a very welcome step in the right direction to help a struggling industry that provides so many jobs and contributes so heavily to the quality of life in the city. By opening up more seating, we can hire more people back and we know we can do this safely. We are so pleased that Philadelphia is joining other leading world cities to make this a priority in streamlining the process, bringing business and government together for the benefit of all. It is a step in the right direction and essential aid to help restaurants stay in business and provide a great quality of life this summer for residents of Center City. If people can't get back to dining out and enjoying the city, they're likely to be less interested in staying in the city. So thank you for making this a priority and moving quickly with it. This measure is also a powerful lifeline. So we have a fighting chance at staying in business until there is some return to normalcy. No one knows when restaurants can return to the capacity they were designed for. So outdoor seating is so important. This change will also allow us to hire back more staff because we can make more revenue. We are glad that the city is working with the Department of Health to do it safely and use best practices. You know, most restaurants followed safe opening and distancing guidelines this weekend. However, I am hearing that there were some exceptions. Responsible restaurants that are trying to survive while keeping staff and patrons safe should not be penalized for the acts of rule breakers. In fact, this shows how important it is to have these clear guidelines in place. We are in the restaurant industry and we are well trained in the importance of sanitation and health regulations. Without a clear plan in place with appropriate safety measures, individuals will take matters into their own hands and allow unsafe conditions. These are strong safety and social distancing guidelines in place and the industry must follow these guidelines as most of us have been doing. We don't want businesses going rogue. We want a collaborative effort between business and the city which balances business concerns with public, public safety. You know, I am, and I'll close uh, with this, I am, however, concerned about the money we are going to spend on the semi-permanent parklets and streeteries at a time when we have so many additional expenses in reopening safely, and then we'll have to take them down for good at the end of the season. My hope is that this can be a pilot program and an ongoing opportunity to add to the quality of life in the city on a more permanent basis and also help us recoup our investments. Uh, I hope you'll consider that at the, at the appropriate time um, that we could consider expanding this um, longer term. And I'm happy to go over the economics of this change with you and how we can make it work out in the long term for everybody concerned. Another way 
other cities are helping their restaurants and residences is to temporarily convert other appealing public spaces into outdoor eating spaces. So I hope we can consider that soon as well so we can all get through this without losing more of our vital restaurants that help make the city what it is. Thank you so much for pushing these bills forward. It is a lifeline for our industry and we hope you will uh, join us in encouraging Philadelphians to patronize the restaurants that have outdoor seating right now. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your passion and testimony. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. Does anyone on the committee um, have any questions for this particular witness? Seeing and hearing there are none. Um, again, thank you for your passion and testimony. We will we definitely appreciate it. We'll be I have a question, Mr. Oh, Chair. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilmember Johnson. I apologize. Yeah, that's okay, Mr. Chair. I just want to take a moment and just thank um, Nicole Marquise for um, one, her investment of her businesses here in the city of Philadelphia. And even though her businesses took a hit, um, that did not stop her from organizing and providing um, food for those who are most in need to make sure that people weren't going to bed um, hungry during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And that says a lot about uh, her business model, and most importantly, her character. And so, um, Nicole, I just wanted to just personally, publicly thank you, you know, because a lot of businesses who were severely impacted by COVID-19 didn't even have the ability um, to support um, their workers. But you went over and beyond and said, listen, I'm going to steal you just as an opportunity to help those who are most in need. And so on behalf of the city of Philadelphia, I just want to personally thank you. Um, I did um, a couple door dash with um, Bar Bonbon, you know, uh, and um, a couple times came up curbside for Hip City Veg. And so um, keep up the good work and we appreciate you. Wow, that is an honor. Thank you, Councilman uh, Johnson, uh, for all of your support these years and for the entire council um, for patronizing, for coming to our restaurants and supporting us. And I'm so thrilled to work together to help this city thrive. Councilman Johnson, those words mean more to me than you know. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless. Thank you, Councilman Johnson. We appreciate it. And uh, I echo the sentiments of my colleague. Thank you for your work and your service to our city. And again, thank you for your passionate testimony. Um, we appreciate it. We heard you loud and clear. And uh, it will be considered as we deliberate. Does any other members of the committee have any other questions for this particular witness? Seeing and hearing there are none. Um, thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. Mr. Maynard, can you please call the next witness? Of course, Mr. Chairman. The next witness is Paul Levy from the Center City District. After Mr. Levy is Michelle Simone from Hinge Cafe. Thank you. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Thomas. My name is Paul Levy. I'm the president of the Center City District, and thank you to you and all members of council and the administration for working on this effort. I am pleased to support both Council Bills 200, 351, and 352. I'm going to put some numbers on this as a starting point. In the month of April, Philadelphia lost 100,000 jobs, or 13.4% of its jobs. 35,800 of those jobs are in restaurant and food services. So one third of all jobs we lost in the city are in restaurant and food services. In 2019, restaurants and food services generated $193 million in municipal wage, sales tax, bird, and liquor taxes. So this is both a major job generator and a tax generator for the city. Between 2009 and 2019, food services and drinking establishments were the second fastest growing segment of employment in Philadelphia. Now, more of all of those gains have been lost hopefully only temporarily. I say temporarily because I, we think many of these jobs will come back. And we have two sets of surveys we've done, of one of 128 restaurants in Center City and the second of 17,000 customers who live in and around Center City. What was very clear in these surveys is that 52% of all restaurants we surveyed said they planned to open immediately this last Friday when it became possible. Another 24% said they would open within one to two weeks, but 24% 
set a much longer timetable and these are the restaurants many of us worry may never come back and so this bill that you are considering i think can be extremely helpful as several of the witnesses have already testified testified do just to social distancing requirements every restaurant and bar will lose between 40 to 50 percent of the seating they have inside for those who already enjoy outdoor seating, they will lose 50 to 60% of what they had in 2019, not only to accommodate social distancing, but the movement of other pedestrians on the street. So without expanded sidewalk seating to cover operating costs, we're at risk of losing many more businesses. So I thank the members of the administration for their ideas about streeteries or parklets, but I wanna suggest we're going to need to do more Many restaurants, as you know, have stayed alive through takeout and delivery. Due to reduced seating, 78% of the restaurants in the survey we did plan to continue and encourage takeout after reopening because they're gonna to need to rely on that business to compensate for what they're gonna lose inside. When we asked restaurants what were their priorities for the expanded use of sidewalk, no surprise, 63% put outdoor seating first but right behind it at 58% was picking up orders for takeout. In short, we need not only to plan for outdoor seating, but to accommodate the lines for people waiting. And in my written testimony, I have a picture on Samson Street of a line of people going back 20 or 30 people long. So imagine restaurants open with people waiting for takeout. Imagine people sitting on the sidewalk and then adjacent retailers also having lines. So I want to urge here a consideration of a broader approach. Recovery, as I think we all know, is not going to be like turning on a switch and everything starting immediately. 40% of our jobs in Center City are in office buildings, and very few office buildings expect to approach even 50% occupancy before September. Our hotels and hospitality industry won't really be in revival stage till late in the fall and early 2021. So tourism and conventions are not coming back quickly. Many colleges and universities will be actually teaching remotely. Therefore, what I think is really clear is that we're gonna have to rely on a lot of our own residents to support restaurants. That seems obvious, but we're gonna be losing worker demand, we're gonna be losing hotel demand, we're gonna be losing some student demand. In the survey that we've distributed to 17,000 residents of Greater Center City, 62% said they expected to dine out less than they used to, and 57% said they don't expect to dine out for two to three weeks. But 92% said they would strongly prefer to dine outside. These safety provisions, the legitimate anxieties about COVID and the return of COVID are very clear. So we need to plan not only for outdoor seating, but we need to plan for continued takeout lines and we need to plan, plan for lines of adjacent retailers. So more than ever, business recovery is going to be local. What was most important in this survey in Center City, and I think it will hold across the city, 70% of the customers who purchased takeout in the last three months walked to the restaurant. They did not drive. 5% biked. 25%, 29% did rely on vehicles. We know from lots of conversations with restaurants that they would prefer more options on the street. In my testimony, I included a diagram of what I would recommend as a fifth option. I'll simply describe it verbally. If you start from the building line, it would be to keep that space immediately adjacent to the building available for takeout and waiting, but for those who don't need it, that could be outdoor seating. It proposes then to use the edge of the sidewalk adjacent to the curb for outdoor seating, but to take the parking lane and convert it not to seating, but to a pedestrian walkway. That way you move all pedestrians into a safely area where we use the same plastic bollards that we use for bike lanes. And you have a dedicated lane for pedestrians who don't need to weave in and between the tables, which I think would raise a great concern. We could add speed bumps as we've done across the city to slow it down on those corridors. I think restaurants will also benefit enormously from weekend closings. 
I should say in our estimate, we looked in detail at 13th Street and 18th Street in Center City and talked to many restaurants. The streetery solution, which is a good one on 13th Street, will add 88 more seats. The idea that we've proposed to have seating on the sidewalks and pedestrians in the dedicated curb lane will add 226 more seats. So that's 88 seats compared to 226 seats. So I strongly support these two bills, 351 and 352, because they support job recovery. I urge city council and the administration to think about a fifth option and to address council president's concerns, which I think are very real. I think a lot of the bid and corridor managers across the city can play a very important role in communicating to those bad actors on their corridors not to have overcrowded seating because it will really create problems for others. In closing, I just want to say that, as I said, we've done an extensive detailed analysis of two blocks. We are prepared for all the bid and other corridor managers across the city to do an online uh, sort of seminar of how we did those calculations, how to figure out social distancing. Clearly, each restaurant can do this for themselves, but to do a comprehensive plan for each corridor is something we'd be more than glad to support. So I thank you for the opportunity to testify and thank both members of the administration and council for their leadership in exploring how we can support business recovery in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the valuable information. Thank you for the insight. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any members of the committee who has a question for this particular witness? Seeing and hearing there are no questions. Uh, thank you again for your testimony. Thank you for your the valuable information. Uh, we thank appreciate you. it. Mr. Maynard, can you please call the next witness? Uh, of course, Mr. Chairman. The next witness is Michelle Simone from Hinge Cafe. After that will be Alexander Balloon from Ciccone Community Development Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Uh, next witness, please start by communi communicating your name and you could proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Michelle Simone. I'm coming to you from the very empty Hinge Cafe in Port Richmond, uh, the Port Richmond segment of Philadelphia. I have one business, uh, that is my lovely cafe out here. So I believe I was invited to speak a little bit on the behalf of the little fish out here who are struggling. I don't want to waste everybody's time talking about the plight of restaurants going on in Philadelphia. I'm sure you've heard a lot about that. I'd be happy to answer any direct questions pertaining to that as uh, although. And I have heard many comments here that I would love to respond to. Um, and I do strongly support this, the two bills that are before me. Um, what I would strongly like to communicate is that those of us in the restaurant field are here and still alive because we are creative, because we are tenacious, and this is not the first hurdle that we've had to overcome. Most of us do know that life will never return to normal for us. So we are in a state of experimentation, trying to figure out how we are going to stay alive, both now and in the future. We are not confused about the regulations that have been proposed. We are very willing, most of us, to comply with everything asked of us. I am one of those people that did get to enjoy a lovely dine-in breakfast in, uh, at the Delaware Beach a couple weeks ago. And I'm happy to report that my experience was lovely. It was respectful. And those of us who are entrepreneurs are going out and looking to see how things are done because we're faced with these challenges we've never been faced with before. So I do look to other examples and try to apply them to my own situation. Now, each of our situations is very different. So I am fortunate that I have I'm in a, a, a quiet neighborhood. I do have a little bit of street and sidewalk um, at my disposal to expand uh, my operations, and I'm hoping to be able to use those. Um, I think uh, Mark Squilla hit the nail on the head. Please don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, while we are struggling, we could use as much, as many tools as we can to figure out how to stay alive. 
uh, the nuisance people were here long before COVID. And I second the observation by um, a lady earlier. My, the first nuisance place I saw closed down happened about a month ago, and I had not seen that before. So everybody's sort of in tune now with reporting and being respectful, even more so than in the past. And so it would be nice to, in addition to these nuisance people that are doing what they wish to do, give those of us who are respectful a little more power to be creative, to give us a little time to do experimentation, to figure out how we are going to survive. Because that it does, uh, again, as somebody commented, this experiment takes money. It takes more investment. I'm out here trying to buy new tables and chairs for my outside establishment, reprint new menus, experiment with uh, our menu to make it more outside takeout friendly. This has been expensive and expensive endeavor, not just in the loss of income, but also in the amount of investment to recreate ourselves, which all of us will do. And in a lot of ways, this will, will be a survival of the fittest situation where those of us who can figure out how to make things work in this new environment, whatever that new environment may be, will be here. So the more tools to that effect would be wonderful. I would also like to say I, I second the, um, the notion that continuing the uh, allowance of such, such opportunities past the December deadline would also be beneficial or streamlining the ability to formalize sidewalk cafes and other such um, opportunities. I am definitely one of those businesses that did try to apply for the sidewalk cafe in the past, and I still have the box beside me of the paperwork, the massive paperwork trying to collect to do that. So giving us, maybe this will be a proof in the pudding situation to see, can we make this work? And to streamline that process for those of us who are able to survive, to be able to, to carry the torch in Philadelphia of the, uh, the independent restaurateurs. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here, to be able to speak on the behalf of us little fish and uh, welcome any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you for your passionate testimony. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. Are there any questions from anyone, uh, any members, any council members on the committee or any council members that's a part of the hearing right now? So I have a question. Um, you, your business is in the Port Richmond section of the city, which is uh, a little more residential than some of the uh, other witnesses that we've had come testify. I'm wondering, just based on formal and informal relationships that you have with people in that neighborhood, what are their thoughts on um, businesses expanding and how will it impact their everyday life as far as just uh, social norms for them? Like you said, we're, we're a little bit different for those of you not familiar with Port Richmond. Port Richmond, we are very residential. I am on the corner of a very residential block. And what we're faced with out here is um, collaborating. And luckily, um, most of us out here are, are very friendly with each other. Most of us businesses are very friendly with each other. And the situations are a little more unique. What I foresee out here is a lot of us um, putting our heads together and collaborating and using those tools. For example, I am hoping to be able to close a very small section of street um, beside my establishment that shouldn't affect traffic flow and inviting a couple other restaurants that might not have that capacity to join me and to make events where we have a little more space to social distance than the sidewalks allow and being mindful and respectful of parking and traffic patterns I have the ability to do that and invite other people uh, have to join me, as, especially other businesses. So, for example, we might do something that we had never done before and offer a dinner situation, invite um, a local liquor company that has a liquor license, which we do not, and maybe the ice cream place down the street on our space where we can, um, we can social distance. So hopefully um, Port Richmond is known for being friendly 
and I'm hoping that um, the people that have access to such things will open their streets to other businesses and will collaborate. The neighbors are chomping at the bit to have a place to go. I hear it from my customers every day who have been very respectful, have been very respectful of, of everything. I know they're very anxious to take a seat somewhere. So I don't foresee any opposition here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other council members and members of the committee who have a question for this witness? Seeing and hearing there are none, uh, I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the information. We appreciate it and we will consider it as we um, consider these bills. Mr. Maynard, can you please call the next witness? Of course, Mr. Chairman. The next witness is Alexander Balloon from Tacone Community Development Corporation. After that, we'll hear from uh, Will Tung from Fifth Square Pack. Thank you. Uh, to the next witness, please state your name and proceed with your testimony. I, th I think you're muted. Good morning, members of City Council. My name is Alex Balloon, and I'm Executive Director of the Tacone Community Development Corporation. We are a neighborhood based nonprofit revitalization organization that directly assists more than 130 small businesses in the Tacone neighborhood of Philadelphia. Today, I'm speaking in support of both bills, which allow sidewalk cafes to expand to adjacent frontage and sidewalk. Our neighborhood business districts are, and small businesses are hurting. Tacone, like many other neighborhoods in Philadelphia, is an outlying middle neighborhood, a stable community with a stable housing market. We don't have the trendy nightlife that some other neighborhoods do, but we do have local diners, restaurants, and bars. They are the place you meet in the community, and they are usually local landmarks. They hire people from the neighborhood, many who are re-entering the workforce or entering the workforce for the first time. Many have been laid off and are struggling to meet their expenses such as rent. They often are family owned. I can tell you this committee that these mom and pop businesses that I've spoken with are in dire financial condition. I'll summarize my remarks because Mr. Levy covered many of the points I was going to make, but this bill can provide a significant amount of help. In Tacone, we may not need to close down the entire street, but just add tables and expand frontage to a vacant storefront or lot with the owner's permission. By allowing additional sidewalk seating, this helps to expand revenue to support these establishments to pay employees. COVID-19 requires us to rethink and respond to challenges without the luxury of time. Other cities are leading the way with repurposing and reimagining space, and we should join them as we adapt to support our small restaurants. Thank you. And I wanna thank council members Heenan and Dom for their leadership. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any council members or members of the committee who have a question for this particular witness. Seeing and hearing there are no questions, uh, I again want to thank you for your testimony. We appreciate the valuable information. Thank you. Mr. Maynard, can you please call the next witness? Of course, Mr. Chairman. The next witness is Will Tung from Fifth Square Pack. After that, we'll hear from Quamira Edwards from Sojourn Philly. Thank you. Please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is uh, Will Tom. I'm calling from my home in Southwest Philly, and I'm speaking on behalf of Fifth Square, Philadelphia's urbanist pack, advocating for better public space in our city. We're testifying in support of bills 200351 and 200352, which make it easier for restaurants citywide to operate sidewalk cafes and authorizes the streets department to reallocate street space for the use of people during the uh, pandemic. Because of the pandemic, vehicle travel has dipped to an unprecedented low level, while vehicle speeds have skyrocketed, and unfortunately, so has road and pedestrian fatalities. Uh, last month, we released our Recovery Streets platform with the Bicycle Coalition and the Clean Air Council, detailing how Philly can best adapt its streets for this crisis using best practices from across the country. Streamlining outdoor vending and seating is one of several platform items, and these two bills are a good start and moving toward what other cities are already providing its citizens. Opening street space to people and not just cars is necessary to maintain social distancing. Uh, many sidewalks in Philly are way too narrow for people to pass at a six foot distance, let alone accommodate a takeout line or outdoor seating. Um, ADA accessibility is also an important consideration and we're happy that these bills allow restaurants to open operate outside 
for maintaining ADA access and social dis distancing through ad adapting our street space. Um, we applaud the outdoor dining guidelines the city has put out. Um, however, we noticed that the city is limiting full street closures to just one weekend, um, and the Kenny administration should create an official process for successful pilots to apply to continue on a weekly or even daily basis, depending on context. So many restaurant dense corridors and all the jobs and neighborhood vitality these businesses support could benefit from regular pedestrian only hours, whether it's past Yonk, Germantown Avenue, South Street, Baltimore, uh, 13th Street, uh, Market Street, um, or any of our other 180 distinct commercial corridors across the city. Uh, we applaud council's efforts to adapt to our current situation and we encourage council and the mayor's office to move further by providing the following. Number one, an open streets plan that adapts more streets beyond MLK Drive for recreation and active travel. Number two, establish a citywide network of calm streets that discourages through traffic on select neighborhood streets. Cities like Oakland and New York have shown this to be successful without a police presence. And number three, expand bus only and temporary bike lanes to encourage public transit and active travel in order to avoid an onslaught of traffic by incentivizing alternatives to driving once they once people start returning to work. Um, so thank you for your time and uh, stay well. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for the valuable information. We appreciate it. Are there any council members or members of the committee with a question for this particular witness? Seeing and hearing there are none, uh, I again want to thank you for your testimony. We appreciate the valuable information, um, and it will be considered as we deliberate these bills. Mr. Maynard, can you please call the next witness? Mr. Maynard, you're on mute. My apologies, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next witness is Quamira Edwards from Sojourn Philly, and our final witness today is Adam Leiter from East Pass Young Avenue Business Improvement District. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Uh, before you begin your testimony, please start by communicating your name, and then you can go ahead right with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kamara Edwards. I am the Director of Business and Events for Sojourn Philly, which includes three restaurants in the city of Philadelphia, uh, Jet Wine Bar, Rex 1516, and Cafe Inez. I am also the local PRLA Philadelphia Chapter President. Um, so I work closely with Melissa as well. Um, thank you all for having me here today and inviting me to speak on behalf of these two bills. Um, I want to stress that from an operator standpoint, our primary concern is the safety of guests and staff. I want to reinforce the fact that we are taking more time than most businesses because of the nature of food handling of making sure that we are keeping sure ensured that everyone is safe, not just guests, but also our staff. Um, we employ 50 people across three restaurants and have taken time to make sure that each person feels safe returning to work and comfortable returning to work. That's a big proponent of this as well. That being said, you know, we only have a few short months of warm weather and this really speaks to the timeliness of the issue. I'd like to respond to some of the council members' concerns and they are much greatly appreciated. But the reason for the rush of this is that the fact that we only have a few short months of warm weather, no one's going to wanna eat outside in January and February. So we need to take the time now to make sure that we are bringing restaurants back in a safe capacity that allows for diners to be responsible and staff to be responsible in a timely fashion weather will be the warm weather will be done by october we're already in mid-june so unfortunately time is of the essence here i also want to reinforce the fact that it is the responsibility of l and i and the health department to make sure that things are being enforced absolutely we want to make sure that folks are remaining socially responsible and adhering to the guidelines set forth by the city. I think the guidelines set forth by the city have been quite comprehensive and um, very detailed in ways to do this responsibly. And if L and I and the health department don't have enough folks on the ground to enforce it, that's where the issue lies. Um, 
I think three warnings is way too many opportunities to give businesses a chance to rectify the situation. And I think that's where the issues arise in the items not being enforced. If you are giving people the opportunity to continue receiving warnings, we're not being responsible to the health and safety of our staff and our guests. Um, our revenue has seen a decline in over 60% since March 16th. And we need the opportunity to have outdoor dining in order to bring any of that back. Um, there are operators that are doing this responsibly. We have taken much time in the last three months to make sure that we are laying out floor plans and flow charts and paths to ensure that social distancing is happening. There, there are ways to do this and be responsible and we need to reward and allow the operators that are doing this properly the chance to make sure it happens. I thank you all for your time and here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your passionate testimony. Thank you for the valuable information. We appreciate it. Are there any council members or members of the committee with a question for this particular witness? Seeing and hearing, there are no questions. Uh, I give a testimony. Thank you for the valuable information. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that council member Bass? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. Count, uh, chair recognizes council member Bass. I apologize. That no problem, no problem. So I just wanted to make a statement um, for, for the record, which is that I think that anyone who is here today to testify is not, these are not the nuisance businesses that we are referring to. And so we want to support business. We want to support restaurants. We all eat. <laughs> we all like to eat at restaurants. And so we would be um, thrilled to have um, establishments, great establishments like yours, like all the folks who have testified uh, throughout the city of Philadelphia, opening up and having the opportunity to dine locally in our neighborhood, to walk uh, to a nice restaurant and to sit down and have an experience. Um, but I think that when it comes to the nuisance businesses, that is not what this is you know we're, we're talking about two different things completely it's like night and day and what we find is that there are you know some great establishments that are operating and doing a good job and then there are some not so great establishments that are really operating through loopholes and so that that is what the concern is so i in no way shape or form uh want um our our restaurant community uh listen as much as i eat out or was eating out before COVID. Um, to think that we're not in support a thousand percent. But the question really is, how do we get our restaurant community up and running quickly and at the same time make sure that we are not empowering the bad actors who are going to make life more difficult in neighborhoods that are already challenging? So I think that that's really what we're looking at. So um, I look forward to uh, sidewalk dining and having the opportunity to do that. And just wanted to state that for the record, uh, you know, we stand in support uh, of our restaurant community, but just want to make sure we close any loopholes that are out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Bass. I appreciate your, uh, your your words. Thank you. And I echo that as well, too. So thank you. I appreciate it. Um, are there any other questions or comments from any council members for this particular witness? Hearing there are none, uh, I want to thank you again for your testimony. We appreciate it. And Mr. Chairman, if you could um, please uh, call on the next witness, I'd appreciate it. I'm sorry, but before you go, Mr. Chairman, just for clarity purposes, anybody that's on the teams now, um, the chat section and the raising your hand section is specifically for council members only, just as an FYI. And if you're not communicating, please make sure you mute your phone. Uh, Mr. Maynard, can you please call the next witness? Of course, Mr. And Mr. Chairman, uh, the next and final witness is Adam Leiter from East Pass Young Avenue Business Improvement District. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Please uh, state your name for the record and communicate your testimony. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Adam Leiter. Uh, I am the executive director for the East Pass Young Avenue Business Improvement District. Uh, I, I want to thank all the members of, of council and, and the committee here for allowing us to take the time today. 
I think that so many uh, important points have already been made. Uh, we have submitted testimony with additional details. So there's just a, a few points that I would like to, to reiterate in particular. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with East Passion, we are uh, a longstanding, varied and diverse business corridor that is truly known for our restaurants uh, as well as retail, but uh, very noted for, uh, for being a driver of food-related tourism, uh, both in our neighborhood, but for Philadelphia as a whole. And so uh, our organization's uh, support of Bill 200351 and 200352 is absolutely imperative for, uh, for the, the future of our corridor and, and even the neighborhood itself. Uh, it's definitely being felt, uh, the impact at the neighborhood level and beyond. And, uh, and having these important resources for our businesses to get back up and running, uh, but also to make an impact uh, as economic drivers, as employers for, uh, for the surrounding neighborhood is, is extremely important as well. Uh, throughout this process, we've been in communication, keeping them updated as to what is allowable, uh, as well as the opportunities that are now uh, coming uh, to be available. And, uh, and we have surveyed hundreds of, hundreds of our businesses with uh, a majority responding that they are in, in uh, support of expanded sidewalk usage, uh, going out into the street for on-street dining, and that support is coming not only from restaurants, but also from other businesses, retail and services as well. So there is additional support beyond just the restaurants themselves. I think that they recognize the impact that, uh, that this is going to have, uh, both in terms of bringing people back to, to, again, restart the economy, but also to the points that were brought up by uh, some of the other speakers that this inherently also allows and enables a, an enhanced public safety aspect as well by freeing up more space, by giving the restaurants uh, the area to, to expand and increase the capacity that they're otherwise losing. This also makes opportunities for uh, more, uh, more safe thoroughways for, uh, for the, the general public as well. So any impact that, uh, that that the, these bills can have is going to be immediately felt. Uh, and we strongly uh, support everything that's, uh, that's being done here today. Uh, we want to see Philadelphia get, uh, get back into the lane of leading the way in terms of repurposing and reimagining the spaces that we have so that we can help our small restaurants and, and other businesses adapt and continue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. Are there any questions from any council members or uh, members of the committee? Hearing and seeing there are no questions for this particular witness, I again want to thank you for your uh, valuable information. It will be considered as we deliberate and vote on these bills. So thank you, we appreciate it. Mr. Maynard, are there any other witnesses? There are no further witnesses, Mr. Chairman. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Uh, Chair recognizes Council Member Bass. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, I, I, I seen that you had a, uh, you wanted to make a statement in the chat, but yes. I wasn't sure. If that you, was the last one. That's, yes, no okay, problem. so I apologize, my mistake. No problem. I apologize. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from any com committee members at all? There being no further questions from members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify, I will ask that if there is anyone else present in this hearing whose name we have failed to call and that wishes to offer testimony or any, on any of the bills uh, to be considered that you speak now. Hearing none, I want to thank all the panels and witnesses for their participation today. We value your opinions. Now I invite all panels and panelists and witnesses to please disconnect from the meeting before we go into our public meeting. We will pause uh, the proceedings briefly as multiple participants will be leaving the hearing. Thank you again for your testimony.
This concludes the public hearing of the committee. We will now go into a public meeting to consider the actions to be taken on the bills uh, before the committee today. Are we now in a public meeting or are we going to wait till everybody disconnects? I do want to give folks a couple minutes to disconnect. Um, it, it, I think uh, they have disconnected. So um, at this point, Mr. Maynard, uh, on your end, have folks disconnected? I'm looking through. I believe everyone is disconnected. Lonnie, can you tell me who uh, Michelle Landman is? And Tania Carroll. Hey, David, can you hear me well? I can hear you, yes. Okay, so Tania is the court reporter. Michelle, I believe she testified, so I can disconnect her, but uh, Tania is the court reporter. Uh, thank you, I appreciate it. So just for the record, I'll read the statement again. Uh, this concludes the public hearing. Uh, John Giddy is also here still. Mr. Giddy, could you please disconnect? Or council tech staff, can you disconnect Mr. Giddy? Uh, tech staff, can you confirm that only council members and staff are still here? Okay, give me one second, please. Thank you, I appreciate it. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. And is Sean Baldwin any uh, of like your staff members at all by any chance? Yes, yeah, Sean is the special director for uh, Council Member Gilmore Richardson. And Karen. Uh, Karen. Karen Feigley, or is she testifying? She is from the administration uh, and shouldn't be on this part, I believe. Okay. We can, let's just proceed. Um, right. this concludes.